have a, a template just for tweets because you render tweets a lot and so in lots of other pages. So I can I can reuse this code. It's like a function in Go, it's very similar. Why you want to do that. Okay. Any questions? Uh, how is can you flip back to tweet go HTML? Yeah. In fact I can So okay, so it's template tweet within, template within tweet, that file. This name well, matches okay. this name. The files, the files reference where. Yeah. So in, in my case, I'm parsing all of my templates into one oh, master so template. Just pull them in. Okay. So it's all by name for me. So you can stick a bunch of templates in that. Yeah. File I, I prefer to be more explicit with these and define every one of my templates because then I know exactly where to find it. Right. Like, like in my index page. In my index page, when I am down here, I say render template. This index matches the index over here, right? And so it's all explicit. It's all very clear how I get to where. So anyway, this, this renders this. It creates a div that wraps tweets. And then for each tweet, I render this template. So you end up with a lot of tweets inside of the master container thing. Um, if you don't explicitly define your templates, like on line one, um, is, does your template, once you parse it, take the file name? It's the file name, okay. yeah. Uh, so you can do that too. Uh, and so I added, so yeah, I added it there, and then in the user profile page, I also added it here. That code looks very similar, pretty much identical. Uh, but the difference is on the index page, it's all of the most recent tweets by anybody. And on this page, it's the recent tweets for one particular user. Uh, so let me show you on the HTML what I mean. So here I have, this is the home page. It's slash. So I don't know, know where. But <clears throat> I see here's, you know, this is an example account. Here's another account. Here's a third account. So I'm seeing a mixture of tweets from various people. If I click a particular user, I see just their tweets. So I went to slash example. That's the username. Uh, and I just see examples tweets. Now all of them are by the most recent on top. Okay. So everybody understand the basic. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what the, the uh, description, problem description is said to do, is to make a page listed most recent and then make one that made it per user. Okay. Um, everybody understand that? So that's why I have this here, because I'm doing that in two places. This is the user profile page. I also do it on the index page. Um, but that's just the template. Uh, in the actual Go code, you can see the way we do that is I wrote these uh, data-related functions. And so in, in here, in the routing code, all I do is say, get the tweets. If there's an error, render that error. But otherwise, uh, just render the template at the end. Right? And I pass this model. Model is just a struct. It has a list of tweets in it. And then I create a model instance and then I write it. And so <clears throat> the basic flow here is, uh, you know, I go to here and if it's the user profile, then I go down here. And notice I do a very similar thing, except instead of get tweets, I say get user tweets. And I get the tweets for a particular user. Uh, but the, this code is very similar, right? Uh, this code doesn't, it's very similar to the other one. I render a template, a different template, but otherwise the model is basically the same. It has this additional profile, but otherwise it's, it has that profile because that's how I get this name here. But otherwise it's very um, similar. So that's the bit I added to this. Uh, I didn't change much else in here. Um, so I just added getting the tweets and this API function. Uh, the other thing I changed was I added some stuff to here. So um, most of this was already in here, except I did change them all to take a context instead of a request. Uh, because I realized that the request, taking the request was really not related to getting stuff from the data store. Um, and so I wanted to keep the request stuff on the route side and the data stuff on this side. Does that make sense? And so that's why I changed all these to take a context instead of a request. But otherwise, they're the same as they were. Uh, I did add the tweet fetching stuff. 
So here's how I created a tweet. Um, it looks just like creating a profile, very similar. And then getting tweet. So the way I did this is I made a get user tweet. And I just said if the username was the empty string, then don't add the ancestor filter. So by doing that, it gets me all the tweets. But if you do pass in a username, then I add this ancestor quirk. So rather than use a filter, I could have said filter where username equal and give it a username. I used an ancestor quirk, uh, but very similar. So basically, tweets all have their ancestor when you create them. They have, instead of being nil here, it's taking in the profile, the user's profile. So tweets, their ancestor is all the user profile. So all the tweets for a user sort of fit into the same bucket as the profile. Yeah, so a context is a very sort of generic object. It, it means um, they, they use it for lots of APIs and things. And it's the, the context of, it sort of represents a request. But it's not an HTTP request necessarily. It can be other types of things. Uh, but the idea is that rather than take an HTTP request, something very specific, I want to take a context, something very general. It could be anything. Uh, enough to be able to call the data store. Because all it uses is a context. Um, but I don't have to pass in the request here. Uh, because like I said, request stuff is HTTP stuff. And I'm just thinking in here of data stuff. I'm creating profiles, creating tweets. Uh, returning them. But I don't want to have to think about, oh, should I encode it as JSON? That's, that's on the other side. The data side doesn't deal with that. So um, that's why I took a context instead of a request. Uh, so yeah, so I do this ancestor query that causes me to give me only the tweets for a particular user. Okay, So that's how you do that. Right. Speak, speak for a moment about ancestor queries and where is the ancestor set? The ancestor set here. It's the third thing. So instead of passing nil when you create the key, you give it your ancestor. So it's context, entity, kind, so tweet, and then ancestor. And my ancestor is a profile. So the ancestor is another key for another entity. Uh, I don't have to get the entity for that key. I can just create the key. And so I know the key for a profile. The key for a profile is profile and the username. Okay. Right? So every, every user kind of uh, has a profile. And you're saying, and that's kind of like the parent object. And then beneath that are the child objects for every user they have a tweet. Yeah, so if we look at one of these, I made a test to at example.com. That is the profile. That's the key. It's just this string. That's the primary unique identifier for this profile is the user email. That's how we get to the profile. So that's what I'm using here is their username. Oh, that's not right. <coughs> that's a bug. It should be email. So that's an issue, but uh, Anyway, the basic idea is that I'm using their profile as an ancestor. Everybody following? Uh, and then you order by time. The minus here means descending, normally it's ascending. We want the most recent, not the earliest. And then I put a limit. Uh, so, sorry. So, so we use ancestors when we want to. Uh, when well, we want to basically create sort of like a, a tree hierarchy a little bit of something. And so there's like one category user, and then the user has all their, it's almost like in relational databases, we'd have two tables. We'd have the user's table, and then we'd have a post table, and then we'd have the joining tables of which user made which post, right? But here you do it with, all right, I've got my user, and that's the, the ancestor, and then we have the, the child or whatever, and that would be all the tweets. And so when we have that sort of a relationship where there's somebody who did something we want to associate, we use that kind of structure. Yeah. That right? Yeah, you can, or you can use a field. Uh, either way. Use field? A property. Okay. 
add to your tweet, username, and then use the filter. Okay. So. Um, you'd say Q dot filter username equal username. Oh, okay. Either way. Uh, in this case, I probably do need to do this because my ancestor here is wrong. Because it's not profile username, it's profile email. So I did that wrong. Um, so I'll just fix it. Because email is the key in the data. Yeah, I did it wrong. It's not the user. I still give you a high A on your code. <laughs> the uh, so the so that's that's all I added here were these these functions, okay? Um, but otherwise, it's mostly the same. Did you say that email was the key? Email is the key for a profile. Okay. But I was using username, and that's not right. So, um, okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so the other reason why I broke this up, so the first reason I broke it up was this was too much code in one function inside a browse, okay? So I wanted less code in here. The second reason we break it up is it allows us to test it in isolation. So now I can create a file, data underscore test, So let's say I want to test one function in data. I want to test create profile. So test create profile. Do you remember what it takes? T, T pointer. Yep. OK. Basically, the testing is the same as it would be for regular Go app, except we can import one additional package. But I'll just go ahead and use it. Um, called AE test, and that is described here. AE test .new context, And this gives us a fake testing context. And now you can see why I wanted to take context for all these functions. I don't have to create an HTTP request. I don't have to like make a fake get request. I can just create a context and then test my data stuff in isolation from my web server. Um, so that gives me a context. I think it returns an error. What are they doing? T dot fake. Okay. So now I have a context and I can just test my function. So since I'm testing create a profile, I'll just do that right away. So I'll say profile. Um, and then the username will say is test. And so what I want to do is create it. So I said create profile, end of the context of the profile. So if the error is not nil, that's a bug. Something's wrong. It should not be, right? That means I broke my test. In fact, I'll just do, you know, error should be nil when creating profiles. Um, but was something like that. Uh, but the next thing I need to test, so that tests that this doesn't return an error, but now I should test that it actually created it. I should confirm that it did what I expected it to do, right? Um, so I could do that by, by just making queries data store dot new uh, key uh, should create a profile. The profile should be profile dot email zero. Okay. And then I'll say Getting from 
profiles. And then down here we just say, you know, if profile.email not equal to profile2.email, you know, expected email to be set to percent B, but was percent B. And do the same thing for username. So we're just confirming that it does what we expect it to do. Um, I need to go get that package. see if this works. Um, so we can say go app test. So these are compilers 21. This should be. Hmm. That's an interesting problem. Doesn't look like there's an E test. Internal E testing? Huh. That seems like we shouldn't be using that. It does. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't exist here yet. That sucks. Um, we can try this. No, you can't. That doesn't seem right. The issue is that the uh, we're using this data store, and apparently AE test is not included with this set of app engine stuff, so we can't use it. Um, not sure what we should do about that. So the documentation says use that, but in the packages it's not built yet. In these newer ones, it's not built yet. Um, so we could change this to just be app engine slash data store, <clears throat> right? But if we do that, we're going to have to change it inside of, inside of here too. Yeah. And then, Welcome to the cutting edge. yeah, it's, that's annoying. So I'm not going to do that. Um, well, I'll try to figure out a way to get around that problem. Um, but that's basically how we build a test, though. Does everyone understand the idea here? You can just write it and then submit it to Google. Maybe they'll use it. Um, well, you know, another thing we could try, and I don't know if this is going to work, um, you can create, I think it's background. So the background context is like, you could do this to create a context that's not associated with a particular request. This may not work though. I mean, I guess we can see what it does. Yeah, that caused problems, so. Uh, okay, well I'll look into this, uh, but basically when we create that AE test context, it creates a fake dev server which makes it so that you can use the data store. Uh, since we didn't do that, it didn't start the dev server, so it failed. Um, so we do need to create this AE test thing, but I need to figure out how to get it to work with the other app engine libraries that we're using. Um, but otherwise, this is the right thing we're supposed to be doing. Okay, so I'll look at that and try to figure it out. But what we're gonna do now is, uh, is review what we've been working on. And I think a lot of people are, are getting uh, sort of, so what happens when you work on a project like this is 
some large percentage of what you work on will be relatively straightforward, and then you'll get stuck in something. And what you get stuck in you know, is unpredictable, okay? You'll be start working on a page, and for some reason it doesn't behave the way you think you do. And you spend an hour or two hours trying to figure out what's wrong with it, okay? That's very normal. That's a very typical thing that happens when you're writing software. Um, and what can happen is the sort of the skills needed to get out of that rut are very different skills than the ones needed to create a project successfully. And so it's hard to like go from what, you know, this digging and trying to figure out the problem back to what was I working on? The big picture, right? And so one of the things we use to, to help us with that is we use that issue list I was talking about before. So if you've not added your code to Git, you should do that. And you should put it on GitHub. And once you've done that, we can leverage the tools that GitHub gives us to make this a little easier to do. So we can create an issue, and I'm going to call this uh, phase one to do. Okay? And what I'm going to do is build a list of things that I know are wrong with the site in its current form, things that I know I need to implement and fix. Okay? And you can use a to do list which I think you use with square brackets. So the square brackets, space, and then close square bracket, and then you say, for example, uh, ancestor keys are wrong. I know that's something I have incorrect in my code. So rather than trying to go fix it, I'm gonna write it in a to-do list. And I'm gonna go through the site and figure out all the things missing on my site, put them all in the to-do list, and then once I feel like, okay, I've looked at everything, gone through a first pass, then I'll start working on the problem. And that way I don't forget all the other things I was supposed to work on, right? Um, everybody following the basic? So, I mean, it, it sounds silly. It's like, why should I have to do this? I shouldn't I be smarter? It's like, no, you're not smarter. Nobody's smarter. It's hard to remember what you're working on. So leverage the tools available to you. And in a real software company, that's what you do. You just take one issue at a time, work on it, and then move on to the next one. And rather than trying to remember everything, you just use the issue list, okay? Um, and so I know that's one, one thing that's wrong. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I could come up with other things that are, that are currently wrong with the site, but uh, maybe I should come up with a few. Does anybody see something obviously wrong with what, what I have here? So if I log out, I can log in. Maybe I don't want these purple. <laughs> So I'm gonna, I'll add that. So, uh, visited links should not be purple. Okay. And then, does it meet all the requirements in the spec, right? So I go back to here and look and see what it said, right? Duh, let's see. The home page should display a login button and list recent tweets. Does it do that? So if I go to the home page, um, it displays a login button and it lists recent tweets. So yeah, that seems to be there. Uh, user accounts can be done with standard Google login. That's working. The first time user logs in, they should be required to create a username. That's working, though I'd have to show you through a different flow to see that. But um, tweets should be visible on a user profile. So I click my profile. I see the tweets for this user. I don't see other users' tweets, so I think that's probably working. Um, for login users, top right should have a tweet button. So if I log in, there I have a tweet button. That opens an overlay. Uh, so I think that's working as requested here. There should be a logout button. Ah, here's something I haven't implemented. Tweets should be limited to 140 characters. So, you know, I go in here and type a really, 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 really long tweet. And it's not 140 characters now. Does it submit it? Ah, that's a problem. So there's a bug, and I'll add that to my list of issues. Uh, tweets are not limited to 140 characters. While we're at it, I know some other problems. Usernames should be alpha numeric only and start with a letter. Maybe have a dash or underscore. I shouldn't be allowed to put an at symbol. I shouldn't be allowed to put a space. I shouldn't be allowed to put a pipe uh, in my username. 
because those are going to cause huge problems for me later. Uh, usernames should be limited to, you know, to a certain size. I don't know. You can just keep adding things as they come up, right? And and that's how we. And then I submit my issue, right? Oh, we didn't do it right. It's dash space the record. Oh, you're right. You're right. That's what I forgot. So you can edit. I forgot the dash in front. My new nickname for Daniel is Stack. <laughs> That's what What's up, Stack? There you go. And now you have a nice little checklist. As you finish them, just check them. Um, and then when you've checked all of them, you finish the issue. And then you create another issue. And so the point is, unlike other engineering disciplines, software engineering tends to be one where instead of like figuring out how we want to build everything, getting it all done, and then executing. We tend to just get started, okay? And just immediately start working and then build it as we go. If the bridge falls down, you just put it back up again. Yeah. And so the idea is that uh, imagine you're trying to fly a plane from, say, New York to LA, and instead of building an entire plane perfectly and then executing the flight, what we tend to do is, you know, build just enough of it. It's got one wheel, the wings are there, it kind of has an engine. And we take off, and then through the flight, we build it, okay? And when we land, we have a 747. That's the idea. Um, and that's how we tend to build software, okay? Uh, because we can't, it, well, it's just, often when you start building a product, you don't know what you're building. Twitter was uh, a half-week project. They were working on other stuff. They threw it together on a weekend. And it evolved and became a multi-billion dollar company. That's very normal for software, okay? You don't know where you're headed before you start going. And so it's good, a good idea to actually just get started. And that's why yesterday we just got started. But now that we've gotten started, it's nice to add a little bit of process just to make sure we're still going to get there, okay? And that's all I'm doing here is saying, add a little process. Add this little issue tracker. Do your dip to-do list and just go one by one. And it will help you finish, right? Help you execute. So that's the basic idea. What I'm going to do is walk around and see where people are at. So like I said, if you haven't put this in GitHub, put it on GitHub. Also, try to deploy it to App Engine. Um, but I'll walk around and, and see where people are at and see what they have left to do, OK? Uh, and then we'll build that list so that you can execute. All right? Any questions?